you know that at our church, often we pray for you all at Harvest Bible Church, and I think that Pastor Hamilton's probably stopped in a time or two. I know that he's, uh, um, you know, wanted to do that as well. So it's good to be here today. We have three purposes, really, in being here with you, my wife and I. Uh, One is to be an encouragement and a blessing to you uh, through our presence, through the ministry of the Word, uh, just to encourage you in what you're doing and as you're meeting together as a church on the Lord's Day and to hopefully be a blessing and encouragement to you. Secondly, uh, what we want to do for you is also to help you, uh, I like to say, to lift up our eyes to the harvest fields. And, um, you know, we have a community, you have a community right here with lots of people who need the gospel. But the need for the gospel isn't just limited to uh, Northeast Ohio or Ohio or the United States. Uh, And also the work of the gospel is not only going on here. Uh, Many times we think about, you know, we're we're thinking about our local assembly and and things that the needs we have and and the the advances of the gospel in this place. But Jesus is building his church and he's calling out a people from every tribe and tongue and nation. And so uh, God is doing something in in a much bigger way even than just uh, what you and I are, are involved in in our, our limited scope. So we, I, we want to encourage you to uh, be here as representatives of other missionaries that you know and that you pray for and that you support as well and encourage you to remember our partnership in the gospel around the world as Jesus builds this church. And the third thing is, as missionaries on deputation, uh, we're looking for teammates to partner with us in prayer and support. And when I say teammates, I, I, I mean to say that as we describe what we're talking about and what uh, God has burdened our hearts with in northern Chile, that you say, well, that's the same thing. You're, what you're talking about doing there, that's the same thing that we're doing right here. Um, and, and it is. It's the same, the same thing, making disciples, seeing them baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that Jesus commanded. That's the same thing that you're doing here and that we want to see happening in northern Chile as well. So those are our three goals, and, and we trust that will be an encouragement to you. You have a piece of paper in front of you there, uh, and this is uh, just, a, just something to think about. Um, and I, I wrote out a lot of it so that if you um, uh, doze off a little bit, you can say, well, this is what he, at least he tried to say, or perhaps you can pass it on to others who maybe couldn't be here today or something like that. But uh, what I'd like to do is think about three idols that threaten missions. Okay. Now, what I'd like to get across in uh, basically done at 10.15, is that basically what we're shooting for? Oh, that clock's a little fast. Oh, I like that. Okay. So 10.15 is what we're shooting for, right? So four things that I'd like to get across to you. And first of all, they are what I mean when I say missions. Secondly, and the other three are three idols that threaten us pursuing uh, the mission that Jesus has given to us. So when I talk about missions, there may be all sorts of different things in your minds, but really what I'm talking about is the mission or the commission that Jesus has given to every one of his disciples. Someone who says, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I believe in him. I put my faith and trust in him for salvation. And I'm a follower of him. I want to obey him. I recognize that he is God and that he has authority, all authority in heaven and earth. And so therefore, anything he says, I will do. And what is it that he's given us to do? What is the responsibility that he's given us? The commission or the mission. And that mission is to make disciples. Uh, Most clearly, we see that in Matthew 28. 18 through 20, the end of the book of Matthew. Jesus, of course, talks to his disciples. He talks about the authority that he's been granted, all authority in heaven and earth. And so on the basis of that, he says, go and make disciples of all the nations. Right? So that all the nations means there's no people group or area where we say, well, they don't either deserve this gospel or they're, they're not good enough for that or we're not going to bother with that. This is something that is for all the nations. And that that is that responsibility is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. So, everyone in the world falls into one of two categories. Either they are a disciple of Jesus Christ, or they aren't a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's pretty straightforward, right? And if they aren't, then we're telling them, you must be right with God, and you're not now because of your sins. The only way you can be right with God is by believing in Jesus Christ, turning from your sin and your self-reliance and putting your faith in Jesus Christ alone. And when you do that, that is what it means to become a disciple of Jesus Christ, is to put your faith in Jesus, turn from your sin and self-reliance, and put your faith in Him alone. Right? Then, for, so for a disciple, we're making disciples, and as we do that, uh, we say, you need to identify with Jesus Christ. And one of the ways that we do that is through baptism. Baptism is a symbol, it's a picture 
that I am a follower of Christ, that I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. So we're to go and make disciples of all the nations, and the first thing he says is baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when we meet someone who's not a disciple of Jesus Christ, and you and I know lots of people like this, neighbors, coworkers, school, classmates, whatever, uh, even relatives, they're not disciples of Jesus Christ. We say, you need to be right with God, and the only way you can do that is by faith in Jesus Christ. So you follow him, you acknowledge his lordship, and, and you put everything in your life at his disposal, and you identify as a follower of Jesus Christ. And that's often, uh, that, that is uh, identified oftentimes by the outward symbol of baptism. Now, people that we meet who are disciples of Jesus Christ, and we may meet those as we interact with people, again, in our neighborhoods, in our families. I would say we probably interact with them most when we gather together as a group of people who are followers of Jesus Christ. I think I would say, you know, how many of you are followers of Christ? And hopefully all our hands would go up. That's what we're doing here. That's why we're meeting on the first day of the week as Jesus Church, is because we are disciples of Jesus Christ. And for disciples of Jesus Christ, when we interact with them, we're, that doesn't mean, well, okay, you're, you're a follower of Christ, so I don't have anything to do with you. No, the second part of that command says, we teach them to observe everything that Jesus has commanded us. Now, if I were to say, how many people are followers of Christ? Hopefully we'd raise our hands. If I said, how many of you obey everything that Jesus has commanded you? Well, you'd be like, I'd like to. I mean, I want to. That's my goal. That's what I'm striving for, right? But all of us are still in that process of, of becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. So as we interact with people who are believers, who are disciples of Jesus Christ, we're encouraging them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded us. So the commission that Jesus has given us applies to all the nations and applies to every single person. If they aren't a disciple of Jesus Christ, then we are pleading with them, be reconciled to God by faith in Jesus Christ. If they are a disciple of Jesus Christ, then we're saying to them, you need to obey everything that Jesus has commanded you. And I like to say, you need to bring every area of your life under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Your actions, your words, your thoughts, your attitudes. Okay? And that's, the, that's what we're engaged in. That's why we're gathered here this morning and looking into God's word is so that hopefully when we walk out, uh, it says the most the happiest people in the world will exit these doors. Hopefully as we exit these doors, there'll be more Christ-like people than when we came in uh, this morning. That's our goal. Okay, so that's the mission that Jesus has given us. Right? And that's not just for pastors or not just for missionaries or something like that. That's for every follower of Jesus Christ. So that means all of us. Now, hopefully, in that brief synopsis, you say, okay, you're right, I saw a lot of nodding heads. That sounds like what we're trying to do. But I'd like to show you three idols in our lives that can threaten that, that can keep that from doing that. So when I talk about an idol we might immediately have some ideas in our mind of what an idol is. Maybe you've seen on the television or in a National Geographic or something like that, uh, you've seen people worshiping idols, okay, made out of stone or made out of wood or made out of metal or something like that. And they're bowing down to them, they're sacrificing animals to them, they're leaving food offerings, they're burning incense to them or something like that. And certainly that would be an idol. But let me give you a little more comprehensive definition of what an idol is because you and I are also prone to idol worship as well. Right? Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been granted to me. Okay, that's very inclusive. That means everything, everywhere, is all under his authority. So anytime, anything, anywhere, usurps the authority of Jesus Christ, that is an idol. Okay? So we say, how do we know it's an idol? Well, if it keeps me from obeying Jesus and submitting my life to his lordship, then that's an idol. Okay? So an idol doesn't have to necessarily be some physical statue. It doesn't even have to be something bad. It could be something good. But if it's something that keeps me from obeying Jesus and submitting my life to his authority, then that's an idol. And I'd like to just show you briefly, very briefly, three idols that sometimes keep us from obeying Jesus' commission. Okay? I think we've all in agreement where we say, this is the commission that Jesus has given us to make disciples, tell people who aren't disciples of Christ, you need to put your faith in Jesus and become his disciple. People who are disciples of Jesus Christ, when we interact with them, you need to observe everything that Jesus has commanded. You need to put everything in your life under the Lordship, submit the, to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But that commission is oftentimes stopped or stunted or threatened by three idols, and I'm going to group them in just three main headings. 
And if you're, if you're thinking along with me or if you're reading along, you say, these three idols kind of sound like the, the way that John describes the world, the world's way of thinking in 1 John chapter 2, and, I, and that is on purpose, okay? The first idol I call the idol of comfort. Now, nobody likes to be uncomfortable, I don't think. Um, I've never met anybody who says, I just love being uncomfortable. I, I go out of my way to be as uncomfortable as possible. We like to sit somewhere that's comfortable. We like to do things that are comfortable and enjoyable to us. Uh, when, we, when we go to bed at night, we don't try to find the most uncomfortable way to adjust my pillows so that my neck really hurts. I really want it to hurt in the morning when I wake up. No, we want to be comfortable, okay? And there's nothing wrong with that. But if our, if our desire to pursue and protect our comfort is more important to us than obeying Jesus' command to make disciples of all the nations, then that has now become an idol. So our comfort can become an idol if it keeps us from obeying Jesus' command to make disciples. So comfort's not a bad thing. But if it keeps us from obeying Jesus Christ, then it is a bad thing because it's now become an idol. If you have your Bible, look briefly with me at Mark chapter 8. We're going to look in just a few different passages and we're going to look at what Jesus said about this. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's talking to people who are following him, who are listening to him, who are like, boy, this guy's interesting. He's got a lot of good things to say. I want to hear what he has to say. And Jesus says to them in Mark chapter 8 and verse 34, he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So Jesus doesn't just say, hey, if you want to be my disciple, that's great. Oh, I'd love to have you. Just please be my friend, okay? He says, if you want to be my disciple, then you need to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So he's calling them to give up everything to follow him. And he goes on to say in verse 35, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whosoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. So we are tempted to save or protect our lives. Okay, We have a, a way of living that we enjoy. Perhaps it involves, uh, you know, I, well, I've I got to have my newspaper and my coffee in the morning, or I've got to, I've got to have my cable TV, or um, as one of the teens in my youth group said, you know, I said, what do you think you'd never be able to live without? And he said, the Internet. I couldn't live without the Internet. I was like, seriously? <laughs> it's a good thing that you live now and not like 15 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, but whatever it is that we say, this is what I have to have. And I, I have to have it. It's so important that I have it that if, if I'm going to lose that, then I can't follow Christ. And Jesus says we need to be willing to lose and give up our lives completely. Now that may mean, and it does mean for some of our Christian brothers and sisters in parts of the world, giving up your actual life and dying as a martyr. That's what it meant for Jesus' disciples that he was talking to right there. They gave their lives. But it may also just mean for you and me that we give up a way of living that we're accustomed to. And if we say, well, I know that Jesus has commanded me to make disciples, but... That, I, I, I need this amount of money for me to live the way I'm used to living. I've got to have this. I couldn't do something like that because, well, that would involve me giving up something that's too important to me. And so the idol of comfort will elevate our desire to pursue and protect our comfort over our responsibility or to obey Jesus' commands. So Jesus doesn't just say, hey, I want you to be comfortable and I want you to follow me. But if it gets too uncomfortable, then just make sure you're comfortable, okay? Jesus says, no, he says, you must forfeit your life to me for the advance of the gospel. Uh, Jesus doesn't call us to the comfortable life. When he talked to his disciples and Luke, uh, people who wanted to follow him, Luke chapter 9, several interactions there, um, one guy says, hey, I want to follow you. And Jesus doesn't say, oh, great. Uh, he says, hey, birds have nests, foxes have holes, son of man does not have anywhere to lay his head. And it doesn't say anything about what this guy did, but I'm imagining the guy was not impressed. Oh, really? So we're not even going to know where we're going to stay? We don't have a place that is ours? We don't have any property? Uh, you remember a rich young man who came to Jesus and said, I, I want to, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And he talked about some of the things, and he said, oh, I've done all that. And he said, why don't you just give up everything you've had, all your, sell all your possessions, give them to the poor, and follow me. And the guy said, no, I, I can't do that. All right. We can sometimes fall into that same trap where we say, 
I, I, I want to obey Jesus and, and fulfill his commission and, and do the things that he's commanded me to do, but I need to be comfortable too. That's more important. And if it means following Jesus ends up being uncomfortable, then I'm going to have to choose being comfortable over following Jesus. So the idol of comfort can do something like that. What does it mean? Uh, if we follow Christ, uh, it, 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 uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, those who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Uh, Jesus told his disciples, um, don't be surprised when you're mistreated. I mean, are you great? is the servant greater than his master? If they've mistreated me, what are they going to do to you? Right? So this is not something where we say, oh, I had no idea. I mean, I, it is so hidden in the Bible that I would, it would be difficult to follow Christ. Jesus says this right up front. So what does that mean? Just a couple things. We may not have as much money as we might like. You know, where we say, you know, I'd like to have a nice nest egg. I need to have a cushion. I need to have a, a financial safety net. And if we follow Christ, we may not be able to have that nice cushion or that financial nest egg or that uh, uh, safety net. Um, when, he, when Jesus called his disciples, he said, don't bring any money with you at all. I mean, and some of these guys owned businesses. They had money. And he said, you don't need any of that. Just follow me. Uh, we may not be able to live at the same standard to which we're accustomed. We may say, this is how I like to live. I like to drink this brand of coffee. I like to have this kind of thing. I like to drive these kinds of cars. I like to, this is the way I want to live. And if we say, you know what, what's more important to me than living and maintaining this standard of living is following Christ. But if we say, no, no, this is absolutely important. I, I can follow Christ as long as it doesn't impinge on my standard of living. Then we have... Uh, we have threatened Jesus' commission with the idol of comfort. Uh, we may not enjoy the same conveniences, entertainments, or comforts if we're pursuing uh, following Jesus Christ, or if, uh, in the case of perhaps a missionary going to another country, we may have to endure the discomfort of living as strangers or outsiders and foreigners, or strangers and pilgrims, which is what we are here on the earth anyway, First Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. But I say there, this isn't like, oh, this is a terrible life, you know, it's a dirt sandwich and every day is another bite or whatever. Um, but we follow Christ for the joy set before us. We're following Christ who did the same thing, who sacrificed himself for us and for this mission and for this gospel. Uh, we, we, want to, we, we are pursuing the joy of knowing him and making him known, uh, of spending and being spent for the one who became poor uh, for our sake. So we have the idol of comfort, and that oftentimes threatens missions because it's more important to us to pursue and protect our comfort than to, to obey Jesus and to make disciples. Second idol, first was idol of comfort. The second is the idol of stuff. Okay, I call it stuff. You probably have some stuff in your house. Uh, I have stuff in my house. And everywhere I look, I open a cupboard, I open a closet. Stuff. Garage. Stuff. Shed. Stuff. All right? And we like our stuff. I mean, we need a certain amount of stuff, okay? You, you always got to have some of that. Um, but if our desire to pursue, acquire, and protect our material things, our stuff, is more important to us than obeying Jesus' commission, to Jesus' command, then that's become an idol. Um, there's a bunch of things that we can look at in Matthew chapter 6. You might be familiar with that section. Jesus talks about the fact that, you know, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Uh, he says, don't lay up treasure here on earth. He's talking about stuff, right? And then, in the next section, he transitions to another thing, and, and it's a way that stuff can be an idol even when you don't have it. Okay? You say, well, I don't have a lot of stuff, so this doesn't apply to me. If you don't have a lot of stuff and it's still an idol, then you worry. Right? And that's what Jesus goes right into. I have, some of the people I've known who've been most obsessed with stuff don't have any of it. They're worrying about it all the time. And they talk about money all the time. And they talk about things all the time. Because it's their idol. It's what they think about all the time. And they don't even have that much stuff. Okay? I know a couple people like this. And they talk about it all the time. All right? And they're worried about, I don't know how I'm going to pay for this. And I don't know how this is going to happen. I don't know how this is going to work out. That's when it's still an idol even when you don't have it. So stuff can be an idol even when we don't have it. And, and Jesus talks about this. And he says, really, uh, your life is actually a gift from God. He says, isn't life more than food? And, and isn't the body more important than what you put on your body? Like, you can, you can buy clothes and you can buy food, but you can't buy health and you can't buy life. Okay, Those are gifts from God. Uh, and God cares for us. He cares for all of his creation, birds of the field, uh, birds of the air, flowers of the field, things like this. 
Uh, he says, which of you by taking thought or which of you by worrying can add one hour to your life? Or, you know, you say, all right, I've got a big problem. I need to deal with this. I'm not messing around. I'm going to take the day off work and I'm going to worry about it all day. I mean, I'm not going to mess around, okay? I'm not going to just worry a little bit, you know, just wake up a little bit in the night and worry about it. I'm going to worry about it all day. Okay, I'm going to get up in the morning, I'm going to eat a good breakfast, so I'm ready to go, and I'm going to worry. I'm going to worry all day. Uh, I'm going to just take lunch at my desk, and, and I'm going to keep worrying while I eat my lunch. And I, I'm going to really do something about this. Well, you say, that's ridiculous. That does nothing to solve your problem. And that's exactly what Jesus says. He says, that's, there's, there's, no, there's no benefit at all to worrying. And so his, his summary there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, he says, seek you, you need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Our responsibility is to do what is right before God, allow him to take care of our daily needs. So in essence, really, Jesus calls us to follow him and not to pursue stuff. And, and we know people. We, 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 are, we work with people. We go to school with people. We, are, we live next to people. They think the, the goal of life is to get stuff. Right? That's what they're after all the time. Stuff. More stuff, the merrier. But Jesus doesn't call us to do that. As his disciples, our goal is to follow him and not to pursue stuff. So if we pursue our stuff with the same zeal with which God commands us to pursue him, guess what? That's the idol of stuff. That's the idol of stuff. If our stuff is more important to us than obeying Jesus' command, if we say, well, I would like to follow Jesus and I'd like to do this, but that might mean giving up some of my stuff. If that's a problem for you, that's the idol of stuff. In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus talks about that, and I'm just going to just read it briefly to you. You can flip over there if you want. Matthew 19, uh, 16 through 30. Jesus talks to, uh, I mentioned the man who came to him, and he said, you know, what, what do I need to do? And Jesus said, why don't you give up everything you have? And he said, no, I'm not doing that. He went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. He did not want to give up his stuff uh, to follow Jesus. And, and Jesus said uh, to him, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, Jesus' disciples said, hey, we've given up everything. And Jesus says, that won't go unrewarded. I will take care of you. So we have the idol of comfort. We have the idol of stuff. And then the third idol, we have the idol of others our relationships with other people. Now, it is not bad to have relationships with other people. That's a great thing. That's one of the joys of living as, uh, as, a, as a person who's made in God's image. And we have family relationships. We have friends. We have, uh, we have all sorts of, of great relationships with people. But if our relationships with others become more important, if they keep us from obeying Jesus' commands, then that's become an idol. Um, and so in Matthew chapter 10, and uh, just look at that briefly with me, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up here. Jesus says, uh, he says some very surprising things, I think. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37, Jesus says this, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Jesus says, of all the relationships that you have in your life, your relationship with me must be most important. And if any other relationships, father, mother, daughter, son, uh, husband, wife, whatever other relationship takes the place or usurps that is more important than obeying Jesus, then he says, that's not what I'm looking for in a disciple. And this is, this is a staggering statement. This is an audacious thing to say. I mean, can you imagine someone saying, I'm glad you're my friend. Now, if you want to be my friend, you need to be, you need to be more committed to me than anybody else in your life. Okay. Whoa, that's a pretty big thing to say. But Jesus has the right to say that because he has all authority in heaven and in earth. And that's exactly what he says, and that's exactly where he puts that down. So Jesus demands our highest loyalty. He's not willing to split time with other people and say, you know, I understand you've got a lot of things going. Why don't you just take care of this and don't worry about me? He says, I must be first. And he's not saying that because he's arrogant or prideful, because he's saying that because it's right, because he's God. And we need to love God with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind. So he must come first. And uh, so Jesus says in that section then, he says, don't think I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And our following Christ oftentimes cuts into our relationships with other people. 
Maybe some of you know that, that when you came to Christ, that was a decision between your family and following Christ. And maybe, many times in many places in the world, someone makes a decision to follow Christ, and that means your family now disowns you. You are not my son. You are not my, you are not my brother anymore because you follow Christ. And Jesus says, that's what I'm calling you to. And so any relationship that keeps us from obeying uh, of God, uh, obeying Jesus Christ, is, becomes the idol of others. So the idol of others elevates our relationships with others over responsibility to obey Jesus' commands. This threatens missions in, in many different ways. Let me just give you a couple ways here, bullet points, and I'll close. We may have to live through a spiritual separation from unbelieving family members and friends who refuse to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Right? If you say, I'm going to follow Christ, I'm going to make disciples of other people, you may have uh, unbelievers who are friends or family, and they say, you're nuts. That's crazy. I don't want to have anything to do with that. Okay? And that may very well happen, and Jesus says, you follow me. We may have to leave behind friends who can't understand why we sacrifice our comfort and our stuff to obey Jesus' commands. It may be unbelievers, it may be other Christians who say, I mean, I, mean, I think Jesus is great, but aren't you taking this a little bit too extreme? Like, you really want to give him your whole life? Like, that's crazy. I don't want to have anything to do with that. And Jesus says, you follow me. Uh, we may have to endure an emotional separation uh, from family members who disagree with our decision to obey Jesus' command. Even Christians. Uh, if you talk to people who are involved in uh, missions like mission board agencies and things like this, they will tell you the number one obstacle to missionaries going to the field are parents. Parents who don't want to give up their kids. And Jesus says to those parents, if you love your kids more than you love me, you're not worthy of me. You need to love me above everything. That's the idol of others. Or someone who says, oh, I can't leave my family. Right? I can't, I can't be apart from them. Jesus says, follow me. You follow me above everything else. And we may be separated physically from family members or loved ones in order to obey Jesus' command. That's what our missionaries are doing. You know, we, we know and, and pray for missionaries around the world who are separated from their families. They can't be with their families for birthdays and holidays and things like that. Why are they doing that? Because they just like it? No, that's hard. They're doing that so that they can obey Jesus' command. And, and it's more important to them to obey Jesus' command than to simply uh, enjoy the relationship with others. So let me, have you, have you think about that, if you think about the mission that Jesus has given us, make disciples of unbelievers calling them to faith in Jesus Christ, of believers encouraging them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded us, three idols that get in our way and can get in the way of each one of us, and we have to constantly be checking and asking, the idol of, of uh, comfort, the idol of stuff, and the idols of others. All right? So hopefully that's an encouragement to you. Hopefully that's a challenge to you. I know it is to my heart as well. Should I close in a word of prayer? Okay. God, we thank you for your kindness to us in the gospel. We thank you for uh, bringing us to yourselves, and we thank you for the opportunity to gather here with other disciples of Jesus Christ this morning. We pray that we might be encouraged to obey everything that you have commanded us this morning uh, from our time this morning and, and follow Jesus Christ supremely. Lord, we pray that you would help us in our hearts to, to identify these idols, that we would break them down and follow you a supremely, love you more than anything else. Thank you for each one who's here this morning as they hear the word of God, and I pray that we would obey it. And as we have an ear to hear, that we would listen to what Jesus says. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.